Egan. And thank, thanks everybody uh, for attending this virtual presentation. Um, as Craig, Craig already mentioned, you know, my name is Anna Crawford and I am a postdoc at uh, the University of St. Andrews where I'm working with the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration Domino's project. And Domino's is one of uh, the modeling focused projects underneath that ITGC umbrella. So this is the first postdoc that I um, had since finishing up my PhD research at uh, Carleton University up in Canada. And as Craig mentioned, I was focused on the deterioration of these massive tidal icebergs that we call ice islands in that region. So this is really my uh, first foray into glacier modeling. And I'm jumping right in with the rather exciting topic of ice cliff failure and marine ice cliff instability. So today I'll be presenting results of an idealized modeling study that I conducted with these excellent co-authors. And this study looked to improve our understanding of how these processes of ice cliff failure and marine ice cliff instability could transpire. And you'll be hearing me refer to both marine ice cliff instability and Mickey um, throughout this presentation today. But before I jump in, oh, hopefully I can forward my slides. There we go. Um, before I jump into the results of that study, I'll give a bit of background and motivation on the work. And then I will spend the majority of today on the results of that idealized modeling study. And then I'll just give a few hints as to what's next for the Domino's uh, team members. So as promised, I'll start with a bit of background and motivation for this work. And I don't need to linger here too long as I know this group is well aware of the concern for potential rapid retreat from regions of the West Antarctic ice sheet and the consequences on sea level rise that would come with that. We're particularly worried about outlet glacier grounding lines being pushed into areas of the Antarctic ice sheet that are situated over retrograde beds. And these lead into regions of deep basins where the ice is very thick. And we'll get back um, to these aspects in a few minutes and discuss how they link uh, into the marine ice cliff instability and ice cliff failure processes. But before diving more into that, I want to just go over some basics of ice cliff stability and instability. So here we have a stable ice cliff where outward pressing glaciostatic pressure is uh, countered by hydrostatic pressure that is exerted by the ocean column. So the longitudinal strain that is caused by this pressure imbalance that you see here is not a problem at this point in time because the cohesive strength of ice keeps that ice face integrally sound. However, as that ice cliff increases in height, as I have artificially made it do here, um, the forces become increasingly imbalanced. And when the longitudinal strain overpowers that finite strength of ice, that's when we see, could see ice cliff failure occurring. And factors such as weaknesses and crevasses are going to influence the ice's strength. And therefore the thickness or cliff height that can be maintained before this uh, failure occurs. So to describe what is going on at the glacier terminus in a bit more detail, I'm gonna turn back to this often referenced work by Hansen and Hook. And these authors conducted a number of 2D finite element model simulations to explore stress fields near the calving face of idealized tidewater glaciers. So in these panels, we have um, ice flow from left to right, and we have the ocean column depicted by that gray bar. So the top of that is going to denote our water line. And here we have a visualization of the velocities and stresses at different regions within the glacier. And the first two panels show that horizontal speed and longitudinal stress are highest in a region just around the waterline. And the shear stress in the bottom panel also has a local maximum just above the waterline, just behind the calving face. So all of this can lead to extrusional deformation through bulging right around the waterline. And finally, I also wanna note that there is a region of compressive longitudinal stress at the surface of the glacier just behind the calving face. And this could lead to slumping in this vicinity. 
And I think that you'll make some links back to this slide a couple of times as we work through uh, today's presentation and the results of our own modeling work. So we now know that ice cliffs can fail if a stress threshold is exceeded. And to me, this is considered one ice cliff failure event. So how do we get from a situation where these ice cliff failure events lead to the self-sustaining process of marine ice cliff instability? Well, first we actually need to expose an ice cliff and um, that may necessitate removing or the loss of ice shelves. And that's what's happening between time one, time two, and then time three or T3 here in this figure. And now we have a vertical calving face exposed with the cliff denoted by this vertical blue bar. And we can see glaciostatic stresses increasing if cliff heights increase as we progress with retreat around of the grounding line down a retrograde slope. And cliffs we know are gonna structurally fail if that stability threshold is exceeded. And we've been discussing that already. And we'll get to a point where that self-sustaining Mickey process will initiate if increasingly tall ice cliffs are exposed through each cycle of failure. And we'll talk more about that if later on in the presentation. So I would like to mention a few previous studies that have been conducted on ice cliff failure and marine ice cliff instability. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I did want to mention kind of the foundational work that was done by Bassus and Walker. And then more recently, Schlem and Leverman have made contributions through idealized continuum modeling. And this figure here is from relatively recent work by Prezak et al. And that focused on failure at Helheim Glacier in Greenland. And this is showing slumping of the upper surface between the um, left and middle panels. And the removal of this weight then allows the remaining ice column to be turn in, uh, become um, more buoyant and the re remaining um, portion of the calving face is lost due to buoyancy driven calving. And then in the uh, right hand panel, we see the removal of that ice column and the grounding line has retreated along that bed. So it's important to note this kind of study because we don't have many observations to help us investigate ice cliff failure at this point in time. But I will also um, include here in this list, the work by Wise et al who inferred past Mickey activity from iceberg plow marks in Pine Island Bay. And that study's location of Pine Island Bay brings us back to this region of concern for the Antarctic ice sheet. And much attention is paid to the West Antarctic ice sheet due to its vulnerability to retreat via both marine ice sheet instability and marine ice cliff instability. And the relevance of these maps may make some more sense now in terms of concern regarding Mickey, as we now see the risk of exposing these ever greater ice cliffs as we progress with retreat over retrograde beds into regions of very thick ice. And these retrograde slopes and retreat along them into these regions of thick ice can make it possible for this runaway retreat via Mickey to initiate, but we shouldn't assume that will always happen. And again, we'll discuss that later on. But I say that, but at the same time, I need to um, show this work by the often referenced uh, articles by DeCanto and Pollard and company. And we do see alarming retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet when ice cliff failure is represented in these projections of Antarctic ice sheet retreat. And here we see a stark retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet under a three degree warming scenario when ice cliff failure is represented in this model. And of course, this retreat is associated with large sea level rise contributions over the coming centuries. So in that modeling work that was shown on the previous slide, retreat via ice cliff failure is represented by this horizontal wastage rate that is denoted by W in this um, equation. And this wastage rate considers a critical cliff height and a realized cliff height. And cliff failure will occur in the model when cliff height is greater than that critical height after modification for other factors that all wrapped up in this term um, F in this equation. And that includes back stress and pressure from meltwater that's working to open crevasses. 
So W represents the horizontal retreat rate of the entire ice column and ramps up from zero meters per year to a maximum value that is now included as a tunable parameter in the latest work that was published just earlier this year. So where are we now given the ice sheet projections with ice cliff failure that we just considered? The ice sheet model output does show alarming retreats when we include ice cliff failure. And from this, we can see why we need to accurately represent ice cliff failure in these models. But improving this representation is going to necessitate improving our own understanding of how ice cliff failure will occur. And so far, this has really been challenged by a lack of observations, as well as the um, need to make assumptions regarding stress thresholds that we need to make when we rely solely on continuum models. But that's where I see our uh, Domino's work with this idealized modeling study kind of sliding in and making a strong contribution. So given that we need to improve our understanding of how ice cliff failure will unfold and that need for a reliable parameterization for ice sheet models, our project used a suite of high resolution 3D glacier models with three aims in mind. We looked to first um, investigate the basic process of ice cliff failure. We wanted to derive a solution to represent ice cliff failure in ice sheet models. And finally, we wanted to look at what factors and processes could counter runaway marine ice cliff instability retreat. And uh, with this work, we had uh, three models in our toolbox to use. And we use these individually as well as in coupled workflows. So we utilized the full Stokes continuum model, Elmer Ice, to model the viscous deformation of the idealized glacier calving faces. And this is an example of Elmer Ice uh, simulating store glacier in Greenland. Elmer Ice was paired with the Helsinki discrete element model, um, which and here we have HIDEM BE, which is the standard brittle elastic, brittle elastic Im implementation of HIDEM. And this numerical model represents glaciers as assemblages of densely packed discrete particles that are bonded by elastic breakable beams. And these beams or bonds will fracture when the critical strain threshold is exceeded. So HIDEM BE has uh, until now primarily been used to explore tensile failure and has successfully simulated calving events in Svalbard and Greenland, as well as in Antarctica. And so in this study, we do use HIDEM BE to simulate tensile failure, but we also use it to explore shear failure. And we do that by adjusting the parameters that influence micro damage and shear strength in this model. Finally, the third model in our toolbox is HIDEM VE, which I hope isn't going to get too confusing with HIDEM BE. So HIDEM VE is the brittle viscoelastic implementation of HIDEM. And we employ this model on its own to investigate viscoelastic flow in ice cliff failure. And in HIDEM BE, particles are still connected by those breakable beams, so it does still capture the brittle elastic component of deformation. However, we also now apply attractive forces uh, between adjacent particles that are within a certain radius of each other. And that allows the model to also mimic viscous deformation. So um, now I just wanna summarize that last slide. So, and give a bit of a brief description of what these models are used to assess in terms of ice cliff failure mechanisms. So first we have Elmer Ice and HIDEM BE paired in a coupled workflow. And we use that to look at how viscous deformation and tensile failure interact in the ice cliff failure process. We also use HIDEM BE to explore shear failure. And finally, we use HIDEM BE to look into viscoelastic flow. And just to um, help us uh, keep ourselves organized, as we move through this section of the presentation, there will always be a little blue square at the bottom right a corner of your screen to remind us um, which uh, workflow or model we are 
concentrating on at that point. So before getting into the results, one last slide to go through. I just want to give some notes about our idealized simulations. They started with a footprint of a glacier that was four kilometers in length and three kilometers in width. And we tested for failure over a thickness range at the calving face that uh, ranged from 800 meters to 2,500 meters in thickness. The glaciers were well grounded and we looked at the influence of ice temperature. So we modified ice temperature from minus five, minus 10 to minus 20 degrees Celsius. We assigned basal slip and inflow velocities so that the Elmer ice simulations had velocities of about one and a half to two kilometers per year. And our Elmer ice time step was uh, six hours. I, I'll also mention that you know, we did do some extra simulations that did look at the degree of buoyancy and modifying uh, the basal slip values. And finally, we worked with uh, HIDEM VE simulations that used this general setup, but we also applied HIDEM VE to domains that were representative of Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. And we'll get to that um, right at the end of this section of the presentation. So finally, moving into results of the study. Um, first is this failure mechanism where we have viscous deformation leading to brittle failure. And this mode of failure applies to undamaged ice that is strong in shear. And what we have in this panel is uh, kind of showing the workflow as well as the ice cliff failure event. So in panel B, we have the initial uh, geometry as set up in Elmer ice. And then we have the deformed geometry after a given length of time um, in an Elmer ice simulation. And that's shown in panel A. So you see the deformation it has this characteristic forward lean at the terminus. We have lowering of the ice surface. And we also have that bulging around the water line due to, con due to the concentration of stresses in that location. And what we did was we took these deformed geometries at different time steps of an Elmer ice simulation and use them to initialize a HIDEM VE simulation. An example is shown here in panel C and we would test for failure. And if failure occurred, we would see it because tension had been put on the uh, ice surface and this would initialize a surface crevasse and then an iceberg calving event would occur via forward block rotation. And this workflow is quite unique because it allowed us to explicitly determine that time to failure and the magnitude of retreats of the grounding line associated with each of these calving events. And what we saw was that time to failure and retreat magnitude scaled with cliff height. And that led to retreat rates, which are on the y-axis here, to increase non-linearly with cliff height, which is on the x-axis. And we found that calving rates increased with warmer ice. So if we move from the blue to the black to the red lines here, and that was due to the impact of temperature on the rate of viscous deformation. So warmer temperatures increased that rate of deformation and allowed those glaciers to more quickly reach kind of that critical angle of forward lean at which tensile failure ultimately occurred. We also found that increasing basal slip decreased retreat rates. So if we compared the blue to the pink lines in this plot, and that's because that critical lean angle was reached less quickly or not at all. And you can think of that happening because the base of the glacier is slipperier. So it's kind of moving forward along with the overhang being developed and that critical angle itself is not being formed until much later. So I'm just gonna note for now that we consider these retreat rates to be conservative. And I'll get more into that as we look into our results from the shear failure experiments. However, before that, I um, also wanna talk us through kind of what happens after these initial calving events. So, so far we've been looking at the first kind of cliff failure event, but we know that there has been some deformation and including uh, resulting in surface lowering that all led to those initial uh, ice cliff failure events. 
And we want to know what's going to happen next to the newly exposed ice cliff. So the magnitude of that surface lowering is going to determine if and how quickly subsequent cliff failure occurs and if we get to a point where we have that self-sustaining Mickey collapse initiating. And that magnitude of lowering is going to depend on a number of uh, variables as well as the retreat magnitude that was caused by that first calving event. So um, I'm gonna walk us through this figure that shows kind of three scenarios that we could see playing out. Uh, in panel A, we have a relatively thin glacier that was a thousand meters in thickness at its calving face when we initially started the simulations. And it took quite a long time for the first calving event to occur. And through that time, the surface was lowering and the newly exposed calving face had decreased in height in comparison to the original uh, ice cliff. And it actually was no longer susceptible to ice cliff failure. So further um, calving events were driven by buoyancy imbalances at the, uh, marine, the calving face. And you can see that fracture starting from the base of the glacier in this scenario. When we look at um, the glaciers that we simulated in panels B and C, we see that these are much thicker glaciers. They are both 2000 meters thick at their um, calving faces initially, but the simulations differ in the ice temperature that was assigned to them. So in panel B, we have a, a colder glacier and it initially collapsed um, and the surface was able to lower beforehand and the ice, newly exposed ice cliff was slightly lower than the initial one. However, it was still susceptible to failure through ice cliff failure. And, be, but because the cliff height was a little bit lower, it took longer for that subsequent cliff failure event to occur. And so at this case, you would see retreat rates slowing. However, um, with panel C, we see kind of the opposite. This was a uh, warmer glacier and it initially calved very quickly and the surface was not able to have time to actually lower. Plus you see that it was a quite large um, retreat magnitude associated with that calving event. And the newly exposed calving um, cliff here, it was a bit taller than the initial one. And this is a point when we could see um, increasingly tall ice cliffs exposed through each cycle of collapse, leading to that self-sustaining process of marine ice cliff instability. So that wraps up what I wanted to say about that first kind of mode of failure that we looked into with viscous deformation leading to tensile failure. And now we'll start looking at shear failure. And we know that shear localization leads to shear failure when either shear strength decreases or shear stresses increase. And that shear stresses will increase with increasing ice thickness. And we can play with shear strength in high dam through three different kind of dials. We can um, decrease the yield strength of the bonds that connect the particles in high dam. We can also uh, decrease the width of beams that connect those particles. And if we decrease that width, the bending stiffness is going to, going to be reduced more quickly than tensile stiffness. And as beams start to bend, shear failure can be induced. And finally, the last dial that we have to play with is micro damage. So we can increase the degree of micro damage that we initialize these simulations with. And the figure here is an example of that. So with increasing the micro damage, essentially what we're doing is decrease, uh, sorry, increasing the proportion of bonds that are broken when we start the simulation. And here we can see that a uh, simulation with this increased micro damage, you know, starts to see a bit of bulging at the waterline re region. And we have these large shear bands forming from the surface of the glacier down to the base of the grounding line. We have slumping occurring, and then we have buoyant uplift occurring as a result. So with these changes to model parameters, failure occurs, as I was saying, via shear band formation that leads to slumping and buoyant uplift. The figure on the right is another example of failure with increasing micro damage. 
And the figure on the left is an example of failure with decreasing the beam width. And we really see that pattern of shear bands forming and slumping of the ice surface. And this slumping is quite similar to the pattern of failure that I was describing earlier for Helheim. Um, and I think you could probably understand that link as well. So we know that there will be a transition between tensile and shear failure at some thickness. And the other thing to note right now is that we don't feel confident in quantifying the time to failure for this mode of ice cliff failure. However, these descriptive simulations highlight the conservative nature of the time to failure results that I was presenting for the viscous deformation to tensile failure simulation series that I showed previously. And that's because we know that failure is quickened once shear failure sets in. So finally, um, the last part of this section of results, I'll go into viscoelastic flow, which we simulated with HIDEM VE. And I just want to quickly revisit this model. It's um, so HIDEM VE applies a short range cohesive force between adjacent particles, and that allows us to mimic both viscous flow as well as brittle failure. But because brittle failure occurs over a much shorter time scale, viscous deformation is accelerated when it is incorporated in these high dem BE simulations. So again, we are not able to quantify kind of time to failure or calving retreat rates for these simulations, but they are used qualitatively to assess how viscous deformation and brittle failure interact and influence ice cliff failure. And I'll just um, show this quick video to show you what a high VE simulation looks like. So we start to see shear bands forming. We start to see bulging at the waterline, a large amount of slumping, all of this leading to buoyant uplift. Go on the next slide. So as I was, that video was showing when applied to the previously described geometries with limited basal slip, which an example is shown in panel C4, these HIDEM VE simulations showed a pattern of waterline bulging, similar to the terminus evolution that we were looking at earlier with Elmer ice. However, we also now have these pronounced shear bands emerging up glacier from the calving front for the greatest thicknesses that we tested. A second set of simulations applied HIDEM VE to a domain approximating the grounding line of Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica without a fringing ice shelf. And that's what we're showing in D and E. But failure of the thinner domains was dominated by vertical crevassing and block rotation. And this crevassing was induced by tensile stress that was caused by stretching with greater basal slip that was applied in these simulations. With increasing um, thickness, we saw brittle compressive failure. Um, just looking at my notes. And these, were, these caused shear band formation and slumping to become the dominant, char dominant characteristics of the terminus collapse for these, like I said, greater ice thicknesses. And you can see that a large um, amount of melange is produced through this simulation. But as I had already mentioned, we aren't able to quantify a time to failure or calving retreat rate for these simulations. So we did use kinetic energy as a measure of the amplitude of cliff failure in these HIDEM VE simulations. And we saw an exponential increase in kinetic energy with increasing ice thickness. So kind of similar to the viscous deformation to tensile failure mode that we were looking at earlier, we also see here that there is a nonlinear increase in instability as cliffs increase in height. So now to review these different failure modes that I just went over, we first um, looked at glaciers with undamaged ice that is strong and sheer and exposed to limited basal slip and we found that these glaciers characteristically deform through surface lowering, waterline bulging, and cliff advance. 
And the resulting overhang imposes tensile stresses that can cause collapse via brittle failure and lead to distinct iceberg calving events. We also see tensile failure through numerous full thickness crevasses when glaciers of intermediate thickness with greater basal slip are simulated in high dam VE. And finally, if we think of that viscous deformation to tensile failure being one end member of the modes through which ice cliffs can fail, then ice cliff failure via shear band formation can be considered kind of the other end member. And this dominates for thicker, weaker glaciers and is displayed through shear band formation and slumping. So this slide is here to let us kind of catch our breath and distill some of the information that I just went over on these different modes through which we see ice cliff failure transpiring before we think about how we represent ice cliff failure in large scale ice sheet models. So you will remember this plot from earlier. It is showing the retreat rates derived from that viscous deformation to tensile failure mode of failure. And I use this data to fit a simple power law, which is shown in the upper right. And this allows us to re relate cliff height to a calving retreat rate. And the model parameters are simply this I and alpha. And I fit these to different regimes of ice temperature and basal friction. So we want to note that we consider this law to be conservative, as it does not include the impact of shear failure, which we went over and know that um, it will accelerate the ice cliff failure process. And we also want to note that this law applies to ice cliffs with an unbuttressed calving front. So there's nothing providing resistance against that calving front and potentially slowing down or inhibiting the ice cliff failure process. And that's what I'm going to get into next because there is kind of a lot of hope put on Belange buttressing to put on the brakes um, on ice cliff failure and marine ice cliff instability. So I conducted some extra simulations for that viscous deformation to tensile failure mode of ice cliff failure to see if enough, if Melange could assert enough back force, could ice cliff failure be inhibited? And what I found was that yes, if um, enough back force is applied from Melange, then the ice cliff failure uh, will not occur. And that's what happened in the bottom panel um, that's shown on the left here. And we found that the back force values that were necessary are similar to Greenland studies that showed melange to inhibit iceberg calving there. The back force from melange can be introduced through jamming scenarios of varying melange thickness and rigidity. And the melange will need to be able to build up and that may happen kind of against bathymetric highs or by the lateral resistance um, through contact with fjord sidewalls. And you know, this ability for melange to put the brakes on the system was also found by a complementary study that was published earlier this year by Domino's member, Jeremy Bassis. And Jeremy used M-ICE, which is a continuum model that simulates glacier flow as well as failure and it simulates failure by decreasing the strength of ice in regions of a glacier that have surpassed a stress threshold. So in Jeremy's work, they also found, as I was mentioning, that melange can be an effective break on ice cliff failure. And this figure is showing retreat of glaciers with calving front thicknesses of 135 meters, 400 meters, and 800 meters. And the retreat is shown by change in glacier length over days of a simulation run. And the red lines show retreat when there is no resistive force or buttressing provided from melange. And then the blue lines show when this force is applied, we can have paused retreat, as is in the case of the 400 meter thick glacier, or we could have re-advance of the glacier. And this is what the case for the 800 meter thick uh, calving front that is shown in the uh, right-hand panel. So that study that was led by Jeremy I used M-ICE and it also used M-ICE to tease apart the conditions in which ice cliff failure will occur. 
and when it will lead to retreat and when it will lead to catastrophic collapse. So this uh, is kind of a key figure that shows that initial retreat of a glacier with a calving face thickness susceptible to ice cliff failure will not always lead to catastrophic collapse. If it does, will be dictated by ice velocity, bed slope and thickness gradients. And for smaller ice thickness gradients, whether a thick glacier retreats or advance, advances is gonna be dependent on ice velocity. And in this retreat regime, which is shown in the light, light pink colors, re retreat rates are dictated, or um, they're all dictated by inflow velocity and thickness gradient, but here um, the retreat rates are actually going to be curtailed by the ice inflow. And if those ice velocities are great enough, the terminus can also advance, which is what is shown in the region with blue shading here. However, there is a transition at a critical ice thickness gradient where we see catastrophic collapse via Mickey occurring. And that's because we're at a point where these increasingly tall cliffs are exposed through each cycle of collapse. So this work is complementary to the findings I was presenting earlier. And together our two pieces of work show that ice cliff failure does not always lead to irreversible collapse as dynamic thinning and upstream ice flux are going to influence the height of these newly exposed uh, ice cliffs. So um, a few key messages that I hope uh, you take away from this work. First, you know, our idealized simulations demonstrate the range of modes through which ice cliff failure could occur. And these, this is going to be influenced by ice thickness and, or cliff height, basal strip, slip, strength, and pre-existing damage along with a number of other factors. And we see that dynamic thinning is going to influence ice cliff failure retreat, especially at cliff heights that are close to the stability threshold. Once retreating and exposing taller ice cliffs, instability increases rapidly and retreat rates increase non-linearly. A great amount of melange is going to be produced through all of these failure modes. And this can inhibit cliff failure and Mickey retreat if it is able to assert enough back force on a calving face. So the melange evacuation or buildup is going to become a rate limiting process on retreat via ice cliff failure. And uh, finally, we provide a conservative ice cliff failure retreat rate law that needs to be incorporated in ice sheet models alongside other processes um, perhaps especially melange production and evacuation. And if you want to read up more on this work, um, our, the Domino's team's kind of contributions this past year are just shown in the bottom of the screen here. But of course, there's always further work to do. We all know that. And we're looking to first kind of quantify ice cliff failure retreat via shear failure because we know that this is going to be an accelerating um, factor to the process. We also want to work with our collaborators to determine how to incorporate this new uh, retreat rate law alongside both dynamic thinning and melange back force in these large scale ice sheet models. And kind of logically following, following along from that, we want to conduct actual ice sheet modeling studies to understand how Mickey will play out and how Mickey and Missy are going to interact and um, contribute to evolving the Antarctic coastline. And finally, you know, that's kind of looking at the large scale picture, but we're also quite interested to investigate how cliff failure and Mickey can unfold at particular locations. And again, we'll need to consider the potential for melange to build up in these specific systems that we look at. So that kind of wraps up kind of where we're going next with the ice cliff failure work, but um, I'll just give a bit more specific specificity in terms of the dominoes next steps. You know, I was um, saying that we're interested, you know, in particular locations and, you know, we are part of the ITGC. So of course we are interested in what's going to happen at Thwaites Glacier. And I already mentioned, you know, our concern for the West Antarctic ice sheet and Thwaites Glacier is one catchment of the West Antarctic ice sheet and it has a retrograde bed and sufficient thicknesses relatively close to the grounding line 
um, that would be susceptible to ice cliff failure. We don't expect imminent catastrophic collapse of Thwaites Glacier um, via Mickey due to the bed topography that is around the grounding line currently. However, any retreat due to ice cliff failure or other processes at Thwaites is worth considering, especially if it could contribute to the retreat of the grounding line into territory where catastrophic retreat is possible. And also another interest point for Thwaites Glacier is the wide embayment in which it ends in currently. So we believe that the ability for melange to build up against bathymetric highs is going to be very important for inhibiting ice cliff failure here. So uh, we th also think that shear failure will be influential at this location given the large ice thicknesses at Thwaites. So before starting evaluation of ice shelf and ice cliff failure at Thwaites, we have validated the high dam parameters that influence shear strength. And we did that by comparing uh, high dam simulation output with observations at Jakobshav and Isbre in Greenland. So after that, I um, am now able to turn my attention you know, fully to Thwaites. And I'm working with a number of collaborators at the CSC IT Center for Science in Helsinki as well as others in Edinburgh and St. Andrews, Swansea and Michigan. And I will be personally investigating and the current and future calving dynamics across the varied calving front of Thwaites Glacier. And this is just one example of a high dam simulation um, of a calving event at the, current, at the western portion of the Thwaites calving front that does not currently have an extending ice shelf. And we do see that high dam, you know, can realistically produce, uh, reproduce these calving events. Um, so I just want to give this now as kind of a taster of work that will be coming um, over the next couple of months and years. So with that, I think I will wrap it up and um, just say thank you for making it through that presentation with me. And of course, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss anything further with you all. Uh, thanks ever so much. And I know mm -hmm. that's going to be good. I should get some uh, kind of uh, back. Oh, Shana looks like she's too happy. Oh, so it's breaking up a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm just saying different people look like they're capping. Florian. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> do, do, we have any, do we have any questions from the group? Oh. Um, I see that Yao has her hand up. Um, yeah, uh, would you like to unmute? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Anna, for uh, a beautiful talk. And I was wondering, um, so I was looking at the, you, 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 reprodu you produced many of the beautiful simulation of surf that shows surface failures. Um, and I was wondering how consistent are those um, failure phenomenon um, compared with traditional classical fracture mechanics like linear elastic fracture mechanics or, or the nice zero approximation. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I we I think most of the comparisons you know that have kind of shown high dam to work well in the past have been done um, for other glaciers in Svalbard and Greenland, you know, and so I would kind of refer to those papers that look kind of more into detail of the fracture events themselves. But just to say that high dam has been kind of validated, you know, against observations quite a bit. Um, and uh, so it's validated yeah. against yeah. observations, um, mm -hmm. but also with the classical theories of fractures. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, and um, the uh, kind of model developer is named Jan Astrom, and he's based at the CSC IT Center for Science in Helsinki. And you know, that's his background. And he built this model you know, for fractures uh, specifically, not glaciers, um, but has been applied to glaciers later on. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, have a question. we have a question in the chat from Gavin. Um, so he's asking, how does your, um, I believe we have also the Conto uh, with us, well, with us. Oh, so Gavin is asking, um, how does your Mickey law compare to the one used by uh, the content Pollard? Yeah, I um, actually, I think I, in, I maybe we'll re-pull up my slide. 
uh, if I can figure out how to escape full screen here. Sorry. Um, let's see. You're not still seeing my screen, I, I don't think. Um, yeah, we're not seeing your slide. No. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, just um, so basically, our for the range that I had uh, previously looked at of kind of ice front, um, ice cliff heights that were looked at by DeCanto and Pollard. Our law predicts um, lower retreat rates. However, our the cliff heights that we consider kind of extend um, much further than the ones that DeCanto and Pollard have looked at in the past, you know, because th their horizontal wastage rate kind of um, saturated at a specific height previously. So um, that's kind of where you see a large difference um, in our retreat rates because we continue. Um, seeing this like nonlinear increase after a um, as cliff heights continue to increase, whereas it was saturated in the DeCanto and Pollard work previously, but that's always evolving. And um, if Rob or anyone wants to comment, I'd be happy to hear. Hear this. Maybe not. Uh, so just correct me if I understand that. So, so you're saying that, that, that um, uh, your relationship uh, predicts uh, lower rates of, of instability. Um, however, lower, um, yeah, lower retreat rates for a given cliff height up to a certain, but um, the retreat rates that DeCanto and Pollard used to have uh, saturated, whereas ours don't. You know, so are um, at a certain point there is a constant retreat rate in the DeCanto and Pollard model, whereas ours continue to increase. So okay. it sort of starts off, ramps off slower and then gets lower. Yeah, well, um, the it's, ours is a nonlinear increase. DeCanto and Pollard in, um, included a, what you said, linear increase. And so there's a bit of a mismatch there. And then ours kind of shoots off as you consider these very, very thick um, cliff calving heights. Interesting. Well, where does where is that cutoff? It's um, about. I'm trying to look here. I think it's at um, a cliff height of only just around a hundred meters in thickness. That's at least in the previous work, whereas ours go much much greater, much higher. And that and that height is the height above the uh, the water level. It, correct. Right. So, I mean, so there's, I mean, most carving faces are much larger than that, right? Uh, they, they could not be. right now. They could be, but not right now. And of course, you know, the caveat that I was trying to give throughout the presentation is that there's going to be a number of processes working to evolve the calving front at the same time. So it's, you know, tr we, when we're looking to um, incorporate this law into a larger ice sheet model, we need to be paying um, particular attention into how we do so, so that we make sure that we are um, seeing the amount of surface lowering that could be happening. We see the melange being backed up um, and so that we're taking into consideration all the different processes at once uh, while we also consider ice cliff failure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have another question in the chat from, oh. from Laurie Padman. Um, Laurie, would you like to uh, unmute if I can? Yeah, so I was uh, interested in the fact that you get these very regular icebergs in front of Thwaites. And maybe this doesn't relate to your work exactly because it's more about the failure mode of the yeah. ice shelf rather than the um, grounded ice. But is there something that we learn from the scales of those icebergs that would tell us about the, the state of the ice that you're um, like the mechanical properties of it and so on? Yeah, um, I've looked, are you considering the icebergs that are um, calving off of that Western calving front that currently doesn't have an ice shelf? Or are you thinking of like that floating tongue that's quite fractured? Uh, don't know, it, I just okay. look at the pictures and I think they, they yeah. look really cool and they must be telling us something. Yeah, um, I, I've looked quite a bit at that Western calving front that currently doesn't have um, an extending ice shelf. 
Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to put too much out there in terms of what I guess, but you know, the, the failure mode looks quite a bit like that first failure mode that I was describing of this viscous deformation kind of leading, creating an overhang and leading to uh, tension on the surface and following iceberg um, events. And that would, in terms of ice properties, you know, be a fairly strong um, and undamaged, you know, ice front at that point. But there's, um, uh, it's stuff that I've been like thinking about, but now it's time to get into high dem and see um, if I can actually reproduce those calving events and make direct comparisons to our idealized work. But right. um, yeah. I, I think you might be also thinking about this recent paper that Jan put out on iceberg um, uh, size distributions. And I only just saw that come out this week, but something that I'll look you know, into more. Well, I was looking at, uh, I, I don't know whether it was a moiré pattern on the screen or whether it was mm -hmm. really true, but you had this sort of cross hatching scaled mm -hmm. uh, 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 the, the look of the, I guess, the stress fields mm -hmm. is this regular cross-hatched uh, map of stress. Uh, is, is, is that what the models are actually showing or is it uh, a numerical artifact or? The cross-hatched, um, that I, uh, does sometimes come out of the structure of HIDEM itself just because of the way the lattice is, um, is produced, you know, during the setup, it does kind of cause some of these um, certain fracture patterns. I, th I think that's what you're mentioning. Yeah, do, do, so yeah. do you believe those fracture patterns or do you think that's a high dem artifact? I think there's some, there's a high dem artifact um, to consider there, but we have done some initial um, exploratory simulations of high dem and that, ice tongue that is extending from Thwaites Glacier. And we do find that the fracture pattern is quite similar to that reality that's playing out there. So um, like I said, we are just kind of, uh, you know, doing initial experiments at this point in time, but there's more to dig into in terms of what we can tell from HIDEM in terms of the fracturing going on at Thwaites, um, both at the, the, uh, the bare ice cliff, but as well as that fracturing ice tongue that kind of looks like a conglomerate of melange that's just loosely stuck together at this point. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've got another question from, from, from Yao. Um, Yao, would you like to unmute? Oh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, is there lots of interest of um, incorporating hydrofracture into um, ice sheet and as demonstrated in the Contos uh, model. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I, I just missed the very beginning of that. So oh, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just wondering as, as climate warms, there mm -hmm. are melt waters at the surface and those turns out to have a big profound impact on the ice shelf mm -hmm. fracturing. Um, and I was wondering, it seems like a very challenging process to, to model. And um, it looks like in the high end model, you have elastic beams to describe how the particles break, but that only works uh, when there's no water, it's water free. So I was wondering if this is something you would be potentially looking into or mm -hmm. it's, it's just too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, it is one of those processes to consider and you know, something else that would accelerate the, the, the crevasse penetration and how quickly um, we would have these failure events. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things where um, I'm not personally able to also do the simulations to consider the different, um, the, the consequences of different amounts of fail, uh, water within these crevasses. But, um, you know, it's basically one of those things that to put on the list, you know, of more simulations that we could run to test other factors that would contribute to this whole failure um, process. Yeah. I think that the nice thing is that your simulation gives all the stress field. So actually mm -hmm. it can, um, there can be some additional, you know, <laughs> given mm -hmm. the stress you have, mm -hmm. there can be actual physics written into the code mm -hmm. um, based on the classical linear elastic fracture mechanics mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, it's something that 
I can, I'll ask my collaborators, you know, if they've um, thought about that with HIDEM in the past. You know, I this is my first a piece of work with using HIDEM, but it's been used numerous times in the past, as I've been mentioning. And I'm sure that there's been conversations about, you know, if we can or cannot, um, you know, uh, consider um, hydro fracturing, meltwater production, and crevasse opening in HIDEM itself. So thanks very much for that idea, and it'll be something for me to follow up on. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, yeah. Um, we are coming up on noon here, um, so we'll probably close off sooner. Um, are there any final questions or comments from anyone? Um, just a really quick question. That was a really great talk. Um, you had mentioned towards the very end there that you had done some validation against ob observations at Jakobshavn. Could you just say a little bit more about how those were done and what sure. you found? Yeah, um, we took, we, we decided um, to look at a period of retreat at Jakobshavn when there was little melange that we could tell pressing up against um, the calving front at Jakobshavn. And we um, produced a domain um, from data as close as we could to this period of retreat that we were watching from satellite images. And we ran the high dem model numerous times, kind of playing with those dials for sheer strength, namely um, the width of the beams that connected the particles, as well as the amount of initial damage, which, um, as I mentioned, is just the proportion of bonds that we initially break before the simulation um, starts running. And just looked at the um, stress out the strain uh, fields afterwards, as well as the calving style and looked for it to best match the cat, the retreat patterns that we were seeing at Jakobshaven over that time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, very uh, much, everybody. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, talking to me. Um, we have a rich daily subscription. Well, much appreciated. Thanks very much, everybody. It's great. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks again, Anna, for, for a great talk. And, uh, I look forward to talking with you online. Thanks. Yeah, that'd be great. Let me know when you make it to the UK if you're ever up in Scotland. Yeah. Yes, I will. Do. I love, I love oh. Great. All right. I'll let you all go. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Take care.